Good morning. Uh, super excited to be here today. Uh, I want to share with you some work we're doing trying to what we call closing the AI innovation gap. And just start with what is this innovation gap? Um, so there's obviously a lot of hype about AI, but there's also a lot of like super cool things that it's doing where it's really creating a lot of value. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, Amazon's Kiva robots. They basically turned over organization of their warehouses to a reinforcement learning system that decides where everything goes. These robots drive around the warehouse. They go underneath the shelf, spin up, lift the shelf up, drive the shelf around, and a picker basically just puts their hand out, and every time it's exactly what they need to fill a customer's order. Super cool system, awesome optimization, excellent use of AI. Um, Airbnb is doing great work around smart pricing. They can fairly accurately predict what is the maximum amount that a host can charge and still rent their place. So making their main customer very happy. Um, Netflix has been super aggressive at using recommenders, um, even to the point of choosing individual keyframes that different customers see based on their click behavior. So this like super fine-grained hyper-optimization. But there's, a, there's another side of the story that doesn't get in the news nearly as much. And today about 85%, maybe more than 85% of AI in, uh, initiatives fail to deploy. They just can't even get out the door, and that's not counting the number that fail post-deployment. So there's a real problem with actually being able to do this well. Um, in addition, my team has really been noticing a lot of what we call missed low-hanging fruit. This is opportunities where a little tiny bit of very simple AI would have a um, small or mediocre customer value, but for whatever reason, teams aren't choosing to do this. So I'm going to pick on Starbucks a little bit. The, the Starbucks app you may be familiar with. Um, it's a gift card model, so Starbucks gets your money long before you get a coffee. In addition, Starbucks avoids a lot of credit card transaction fees because while you might be paying 4 or $5 per transaction, they're only reloading your card every $25. So this system's totally awesome for Starbucks. The Starbucks app never learns which customers pay for their coffee with the app, and it never lands those customers on the pay tab when they open their phone while they're inside of a Starbucks. This is not a difficult inference to make, um, but world-class design team simply can't see this super obvious opportunity. It's not just Starbucks. Um, these opportunities are everywhere. I'm gonna pick on Instagram a little bit, but Instagram particularly, this is a meta company. This is full of world-class user experience designers and data scientists. They really want influencers to post because influencers drive the eyeballs that consume the ads. This is totally in their profit area. Instagram never learns which tags influencers frequently use, and it forces them to type the same tags over and over and over again. This is not difficult to do. These are the obvious opportunities, but these world-class teams simply don't notice them. When we talk to companies, a thing we repeatedly hear is data science teams come up with ideas customers don't want, and design teams come up with ideas that nobody can build. <laughs> and this is the innovation gap. This is what we're trying to close. Um, can we bring those a little bit closer together. So to kind of help this make sense, I just want to really work a definition um, and make a distinction between an invention and an innovation. So this is the cassette recorder created by Philips in 1963. This is an invention. It's not really for anyone to do anything. Innovation is sort of the recognition that there are people that need this capability and then it's putting that capability in a form that makes sense to people. 
in that context. So we got things like boom boxes, so construction workers can have music, so teens can, can listen to music while they're playing basketball. Sony gave us the Walkman, a very personal music experience. Um, and then home answering machines was a recognition that, yeah, people feel like they have to stay home because they're going to they're gonna miss an important call if they leave. But, you know, we have this technology that records and plays back audio. We could simply put it there and free people from this obligation. So to me, this is innovation, and we do not see this with AI. Basically, everything kind of becomes a one-off. So I want to unpack this to try to help explain why are things so terrible. And, and the main reason is companies are just choosing things that are too hard. Um, so we think of this, we, this is our, our grid of looking at the opportunity space. And on the right, we have task difficulty. How hard is this to do? And on the bottom is model performance. How well does AI have to work before a customer begins to experience value? And in general, people are only searching for opportunity for things that are super hard to do where you need amazing model performance. So driverless cars, super hard to do. If I don't actually have amazing model performance, people will die. Um, detection of cancer. Yeah, I don't want like mediocre model performance there. Um, and I'm going to blame the media uh, because they love these clickbaity stories that reinforce the idea that AI is a superhuman intelligence. So Target knows teen girls pregnant before her parents. Um, Alpha Zero's beating grandmaster game players. Uh, here locally, we have Watson that won on Jeopardy. Um, Recently, a Google engineers claiming that Lambda is sentient. There's a lot of hype that's quite misleading about where AI actually creates value in the world. And so, in general, most of the opportunity space just goes under-investigated. Another problem is data scientists, or I should really say data science. And it's a, a weird expectation. So IBM's done some amazing work really trying to understand what is data science, how do these people work, and how is it different. Um, most companies treat data scientists like engineers. They want to give them a spec and have them build something to the spec. And that does not at all match what people learn when they're training to be data scientists, which is a highly exploratory type of work. It's searching data for opportunity. That is not engineering. Um, from a design innovation point of view, data scientists are never taught to ideate. They're never taught to think of a hundred things you can do and then systematically select the one that will produce the most value. They just sort of, like butterflies, explore around. It's like, oh, I could do this. Look, look at this interesting inference we could make. And they move from thing to thing, but they don't ever sort of really explore the entire space of action. And finally, there's a big struggle around misunderstandings, particularly around what performance is. And so you'll get a team, they're starting an agile scrum. Um, the data scientist is like, oh, we can get this level of performance. Everybody's like on board. They get to the end of the scrum. The data scientists are like, yes, success. And a product manager's like, that is terrible. We are totally not going to ship that thing. Um, and it's, it's in the language. So you might say, oh, an, algorithm, an algorithm's performance, it's 90% accurate. Is that good? It's like an A minus, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, you'd be happy as an undergrad if you got 90. Um, if you think of an application like automatic speech recognition, 90% means about one word in every sentence is wrong. Does that seem good? Apple, in the iOS voicemail, gives you a super mediocre transcript of a voicemail. It's about 90%. Um, totally useful in this context for this application. Because I can look at that and immediately know, can I just delete this voicemail without listening to it? Right? Like, what is the value proposition that I'm getting? How hard is it to pull this off? There's also like a 
a challenge of thinking about what is simple. So my students pretty much all think of Apple's face ID as face recognition. Face ID is not face recognition. It's not even close. Um, face ID is like going up to a bartender with your ID and saying, is this me? Face recognition would be going up to a bartender and saying, who am I? That is a way harder task. So can, can we recognize that super simple thing we can totally deliver on and stay away from these things that are ridiculously hard? Um, finally, design and design innovation teams are totally uninvited and unprepared to work in this space. So I started working in software in the 1980s. Uh, the experience then was software engineers had already come up with an idea and they invited what we weren't yet called UX designers, but eventually we were. Um, they invited us in and they're like, hey, can you make this pretty? And it's like, no amount of pretty will make your terrible idea something someone wants. Um, and this is where user-centered design came from, but we have returned to the 1980s when we do AI innovation. You have data science teams coming up with ideas that no one wants, and human-centered designers coming in and saying, there's no way I can fix this. We are definitely putting lipstick on pigs. Um, there's a problem with ideation or with the sort of creative act of envisionment so I love the theory of Donald Schoen. I'm a professor, so I'll give you a little theory here. Um, he talks about this creative act as reflection in action, and he uses a metaphor of a jazz musician who knows their instrument so well, they know what it's capable of, they can create music while playing. That is what you have to do when you're envisioning things that you might make. You have to draw from a subconscious space from a tacit understanding of capability. But if you look at all of the taxonomies we have on AI, they are not about capability. They are mechanistic. They tell me how AI makes an inference, not what are the inferences AI can make. And it's very hard to ideate from a, a sense of reinforcement learning, or unsupervised learning, or semi-supervised learning. Th these are not excellent starting points for a creative act of thinking, how do I discover co uh, value co-creation opportunities? Brainstorming totally works against this. So brainstorming is awesome. I totally recommend it. Um, but when you're working on AI, like IDEO's second rule of brainstorming is encourage wild ideas. But when pretty much all of our ideas can't be built, this is totally not helpful advice. So that's the problem. Problem's pretty big, but some work's now happening to really think about how do we close this? How do we move into um, being better? So one of the things that I'm doing and other researchers are doing is we're hanging out at FANG companies looking at where do we see effective teams and what are they doing that other people aren't doing? And what's fascinating is the, the designers and the design innovators we run into often know almost nothing about AI mechanisms. But they have totally internalized a bunch of capability abstractions which allow them to ideate. And they have a bunch of examples that allow them to effectively communicate with data science teams. Also in companies where you have hundreds of data scientists and hundreds of UX designers, those that wish to collaborate, will discover each other, and that's where the magic is definitely happening. Finally, these design teams are highly fluent with data, and they don't tend to get that training in school. Um, the best ones we've seen come up with what they think, oh, here's an inference we think we can make, and they get telemetry data, and they're looking in to say, can I see this pattern before I go and bother some data scientists to see if we can model this. Um, Google's actually got a, a super cool way of thinking about this. So this is Casey uh, Kozarkov. She's the chief decision scientist at Google. And she uses this metaphor called Drunk Island. And she tries to get the teams at Google to do a better job of recognizing use cases where AI would be valuable. And she said, you need to think of AI as an island full of drunk people. It can do things really fast because there's lots of drunk people. 
and it can process an inhuman scale of information because they're a bunch of drunk people. But they're drunk people. So lower your expectation for intelligence. So where do you need speed but not quality? Or where do you need scale but not quality? So generally, you're not replacing people. You're simply doing something where we have nothing. It's these new capabilities. Um, Fjord has done some amazing work at their innovation center in Dublin where they've sit, uh, they sit service designers and UX designers with what they're now calling data designers, um, data scientists, and AI engineers. And they work super collaboratively together, very much thinking about AI at a strategic level. I'm gonna rebrand them, they're now Accenture Song. Um, but they've also started to change some of the low-level processes that are typical in innovation. So if you're familiar with service blueprints, they've added a data layer, and now I can see my data pipeline. Because there's all of these dependencies when you're building data-enabled systems on do you have the data, can you get the data, where is it coming from, how are we creating it. In addition, when they just do simple things like wireframing, the designers are always accountable to where does that data come from. They don't just like magically draw things on the board, but they have to say where is this data drawing from. Um, in addition, uh, there's development of new resources. So my team's been working on a taxonomy of AI capabilities. We looked at 14 industry sectors. We extracted 42 AI features that repeatedly show up in com uh, commercially successful products and services. So we're very much saying in the space of what can I deliver now that I'm sure will work and could be cost effective. Um, we've got eight high level categories, um, descriptions, and a bunch of examples of where this is working in the world. And then we've been using this to seed ideation. Um, in addition, from those 42 features, we could begin to look at things like how hard is this task and what's the model performance. And when we sort of make that a heat map, you can see that upper right-hand corner does not have a lot of heat. There are a lot of hard problems where mediocre model performance is producing a lot of value, but there are also a lot of like very easy problems. Um, where mediocre performance produces value. If you see, think of something like a step counter, it gives you a terribly inaccurate count of your steps. This is something you could probably hire a five-year-old to follow you around if you could get their attention long enough. Um, it's not a hard task, um, but we don't actually need good model performance because what you really need to know is not how many steps, but am I walking more or less, right? It's actually a simple classification problem. Um, Finally, we're prototyping new innovation processes that are showing some good effects. So I want to suggest AI innovation cannot be done from a user-centered design perspective because you've already, you've already assigned an AI development team. So you've already said the solution is AI. Well, that's not user-centered design. But it's also not matchmaking. And for those of you not familiar, matchmaking is where you start with a capability and you search for who is my best customer for this. Because you've already chosen a data set, so you've already defined your customer. So it's not really matchmaking. It's not really user-centered design, but it's something sort of at that intersection. And so what we do is review what is AI good at and, and build from there. And we think of this, we call this the fridge metaphor. So right now, I'd say most people think of AI as this amazing chef that's coming over, and what do you want them to make? And it's like, yeah, we don't have the equipment to do that. We don't have the food. We are suggesting instead, like, open the refrigerator and say, hey, we have cabbage. What can we make with cabbage? Who likes cabbage? Um, so it's this idea of saying, what does AI good at? Can we use that in this situation or not? Um, so I've been working with, uh, in the ICU, it's an awesome space of life and death decisions, um, super stressed out workers, and we have this amazing data set and very stressed clinicians. We've been doing like brainstorming, looks very familiar, maxed up. Um, and one of the ways we try to understand how we're doing is we look at impact effort matrix, 
When we do traditional brainstorming, we're getting things that where we're producing only ideas that are super hard to implement, and half of the time they're not particularly valuable. This is not great. We shifted to really priming people with what is AI good at doing and can we use that as a launching point? And suddenly we started producing ideas that were in that upper left-hand corner that are low effort, high impact. Um, in addition, we changed where the ideas fall in sort of the problem solution space. So in traditional brainstorming, we were very much getting things in the upper right-hand corner. They uh, are very difficult problems where you need high model performance to be valuable. And we had really shifted down to be in a space where these are, are actually much simpler problems and mediocre model performance is beginning to be acceptable. So to just give you a flavor of this, when I showed up, this was the kind of thing they were looking at. So um, when you ventilate a patient, you have to put a tube down their throat. Nobody wants a tube in their throat. So they sedate you so you'll withstand this. If they give you too much sedation, you develop delirium and you get PTSD. If they don't give you enough sedation, then you have a lot of anxiety and pain, which impacts your healing. They're like, we should use deep learning and figure out the optimal level of sedation. This is really hard. It's like, this sounds like a great way to harm people with AI. So we talked about Amazon pre-shipping. They, you know, things they know people are going to buy, they simply move closer. So when you order it, it comes quickly. And said, mm, can we use this idea in the ICU? And, and the doctors and nurses thought for a while and they said, oh, well, you know, we order medicine from the pharmacy every day. And sometimes it takes three or even six hours for that medication to come. And these people are super sick. You want them to get the medicine right now. In addition, the nurses are way more efficient.